As a reminder, I'm doing Swift News on a monthly basis now, and the links to everything I share will be in this repo, and the link to that repo will be in the description. Also, iOS 15 is now official, and I've provided a free update to all four of my courses if you already own it. If you don't own a certain course that you've had your eye on, they're all 30% off until October 8th, which is this Friday, a couple of days from now. Link will be in the description for that as well, or you can go to seanallen.teachable.com. All right, let's set up the rundown and get into it. First up, Swift 5.5 is official. Now you've probably been hearing about it for a couple months now, but is now official with Xcode 13, iOS 15. So what I wanted to share this link here, uh, obviously there's a great playground as always by Paul Hudson. He always does a what's new in Swift, whatever number, check out that playground. But what I wanted to share here is because I bet a lot of you don't do this and I highly recommend this kind of stuff, right? So looking through the Swift evolution proposals. So we'll take the async uh, await one, for example. Now async await and concurrency is a big, big feature. So this proposal is gonna be longer than others. But I wanted to share this because, you know, I just had to recently learn async await because it's brand new for all of us in Swift anyway, uh, to update all my courses. So I found it easier when you understand the why behind things. So you're not just memorizing syntax. And that's what these proposals are great for. They give you an introduction, right? They tell you the motivation behind why this change is even happening with examples, right? And then there's a proposed solution and you can see the discussion back and forth on, you know, how people were discussing the proper way to implement this. So this gives you a lot of the backstory. Again, the why behind why a language feature like async await is being implemented which for me really helped me like learn and understand a big feature like this. So again, if you just do tutorials, that's great, but coming back and reading this stuff and understanding the why, I think is super helpful. Like I said in the intro, iOS 15 is now official and every year Federico Vatici does an amazing, super crazy in-depth thorough review of iOS and iPad OS 15. So much so that up here into the right, there's even a little table of contents, right? So I'll just go to design to show you how in-depth it is. Uh, so talks about things, but shows you before and after, right? iOS 14, iOS 15. You don't see much difference there, but you see subtle differences in the section headers. Uh, but again, if you're an iOS developer building for these new platforms, it's nice to see the new look, right? Here's the design, right? There's no like header anymore. Everything is kind of transparent, right? There's no bottom toolbar. Well, there is a bottom toolbar, but the background isn't this like gray color. It's just clear. So little things like that, you'll know by reading this uh, design section anyway. But like I said, that's just the design section you know, focus and notifications if you really wanna learn what this new focus feature is all about. Again, super in-depth, very visual, tons of images to go along with it. Uh, like I said, it's a, it's a very long read. Like grab a coffee, carve out a couple hours in your day to go through this, but I think it's very valuable as an iOS developer building for iOS 15, because so many little things like get thrown in there that it's almost impossible to keep up with everything. That's why this is like a huge, ridiculous document because Federico does keep up with everything. But again, if you're building for this platform, highly recommend reading this, it's super helpful. On the note of iOS 15, let's talk about iOS 15 adoption. If you're not familiar with this tool, mixed panel trends where you can see adoption here, uh, it's always great to see how it's doing. So as of now, Monday, October 4th, you can see iOS 15 is about 22.87%. And obviously you can see iOS 14 coming down, iOS 15 going up, give it a couple weeks, they'll probably cross, and then iOS 15 will be you know, dominant. But this is always a great tool because you can see things older than iOS 14 are about 5.6%. So if you're ever deciding to implement a new feature and you're wondering you know, who's on the new iOSs, who's on the old ones, how is that gonna affect our user base? This mixed panel is like a huge aggregate of data. So your users may be a little different, but this is a good tool to get a rough idea on how you know, the iOS adoption is going. Along with the new iPhones, we got a brand new iPad mini. Uh, and here's Jeff Hackworth with Adaptivity. Always does a great job talking about resolutions and screen sizes, has a great app for that. Again, Adaptivity. Uh, but the thing with the new iPad mini is it introduced a brand new resolution. And I kind of chuckled when I saw this. There are now seven different iPad resolutions you know, in landscape. So the new one is this 8.3 resolution, but you can see all the other ones as well. So again, what this article does, if you are building an app for uh, the iPad and iPad mini, you want to support that. Well, Jeff here tells you how it's going to react with uh, Xcode 12 and iOS 14 builds with non multitasking apps. Again, very visual showing you all like the measurements, how to handle it. Uh, it Cause again, this is a brand new uh, resolution you need to handle. So 
Anytime you're wondering about a new resolution for a device, whether it's an iPhone or an iPad, Jeff's always got you covered with this Adaptivity app. Super in-depth, super helpful. Uh, like I said, and it shows you this split screen multitasking. This is what I'm dreading because I'm building an iPad app myself. And the split screen is kind of rough to deal with anyway, just building your layout so it adapts to it. But now split screen on the iPad mini, ugh, now it's like super, super small. So I'm not looking forward to split screen on the iPad mini, but like I said, I'm gonna refer to this article when that time comes so I know all the measurements and how to handle that. Moving on, we have SF Symbols 3. Now this is not new, of course, this was announced at WWDC, but the new thing here, well, in case you aren't familiar, right, we got 600 new symbols. This is the third version of it. They keep improving it over time. Enhanced color customization. Uh, the big thing here that I enjoy is here, you can see we have hierarchical, where you get kind of this like monochrome look where it's the same color, but different opacities. And then we get something called palette, where we can like actually customize the different layers of colors to whatever we want on the SF symbol. So those are two great additions. But again, this is kind of old news if you've been following WWDC. The new news, new news, is uh, that it is out of beta. You can actually go download the real thing. It's no longer the beta version, so go download it now. Also new in iOS 15, and of course I could run down so many features. I'm just gonna do this one because everybody's got buttons, right? Buttons are the most common element, pretty much. So how to make a custom button style with the new UI button dot configuration in iOS 15. Quick summary, there's a whole WWDC video about it. I recommend you watch that. But uh, Apple introduced these new configurations where we can get this plain gray tinted and filled with corner radius and stuff style pretty much for free out of the box just using uh, a configuration. When I say configuration, I'll come down here, right? You get UI button dot configuration, and then you can customize that with properties like title, subtitle. It's super easy to add an image to the button. You can have multi-line text in a button, super easy as well. Again, a great way to get these, you know, Apple looking buttons in your app. Of course, if you want your own super custom crazy button, probably have to continue doing it the way you've been doing it. But if you just want those Apple buttons for relatively low cost out of the box, uh, the UI button configuration is a great way to do that. And this article by Saran definitely has you covered. Next up, I have an article from Peter Steinberger, The New Shiny. So this is uh, on the shift from imperative to declarative UI and what it means to build the apps of today and tomorrow. So like he says in the opening here, right? There's a shift happening in how mobile apps are built <laughs> again, right? A few years ago, right? We were building uh, Objective-C and Java, like languages from the 80s and 90s. More recently, we started moving to Swift and Kotlin, more uh, recent languages. Now we're transitioning from imperative to declarative. So imperative is how we used to do things in UIKit. Declarative uh, is in Swift UI. And he says here, declarative UI requires thinking about app development from a new perspective. And I can attest to this, right? I had only done imperative development my whole career, right? The six years before I started really working in Swift UI. And I had to completely rewire my brain to go from the imperative way of thinking to the declarative way of thinking. And honestly, it took like a month or two of working in Swift UI a lot for it to like finally click. And I started like thinking the declarative way. Like it's a big shift if you've never done declarative UI before. So I highly recommend checking this article out. I'll give you a couple little uh, highlights here. It gives the history of declarative, how it kind of started with React Native and Facebook, how it evolved with, you know, Flutter and Dart and all that stuff. And then how, right, platform vendors started getting involved. That's Jetpack Compose, that's Swift UI, right? Where Apple and, and Google or, or Android are actually making their own rather than like a third party framework. How, how those first party frameworks have their advantages. I like this one though, bridging the iOS Android divide. He gives an example of how something is written in Swift UI and how similar it is to uh, Jetpack Compose, right? So there's the two examples and how this can help, you know, two different teams that are building for Android and iOS maybe, you know, come together a little bit more because they are very similar, right? We've always heard how Kotlin and Swift are very similar. Now it seems like Swift UI and Jetpack Compose are very similar. So that can only help, again, bridge that iOS uh, Android divide. And then I'll go down to his conclusion to sum up uh, what I really agree with here, right? It says the future is declarative. You know, that promise of cross-platform development of write once, run anywhere, didn't really pan out. You know, some developers would rather quit than write a couple lines of React Native, right? So the promise didn't really work out, but now that first party platforms are in the game with SwiftUI and Jetpack Compose, they're now reaching maturity. It's apt time to consider uh, adopting them.
And then the final uh, summary here that again, I really uh, agree with my prediction, companies that adopt these technologies will have an easier time attracting and retaining engineers. I saw this firsthand last summer for iOS 14. I hired two iOS developers uh, on a project. And when I was working with the client and I knew he wanted to build a team around this, I recommended going all in on Swift UI. And I was upfront, I was like, hey, there's gonna be some headaches, you know, maybe for the first year, but if you're trying to build a team around this and you wanna attract talent, you know, requiring iOS 14, going Swift UI, we did server side Swift, like a lot of Swift developers, that's like their dream project. So I do agree with this, that you do have an easier time attracting and retaining talent and you'll be able to build modern, you know, engaging apps, you know, to stay relevant in the future. So yeah, even though we may not quite be there with these new declarative frameworks, I really think we're on the edge, we're on the cusp. I think we're about to get that tipping point to where it does become like the way to do things. On to some Twitter wisdom here from Nick Lockwood. Uh, dry, don't repeat yourself, is one of the most important principles of good programming, but it's also one of the most misunderstood. Totally agree, right? It's not about avoiding repetition of code. It's about avoiding repetition of maintenance. And he has a great tweet. Well, I'll read one more, but there's another tweet I wanna highlight. You know, he says, just because two bits of code look similar, it doesn't mean they should be merged. The question you should be asking is that if I have to change this in the future, will I also have to make the same change to the other function? If that's the case, then yeah, merge them. If not, they should be kept separate. And here's, here's the tweet I wanna highlight. So much so I'm gonna click onto it. Definitely recommend reading the thread and the replies and all that stuff. But I've done this in my junior developer days back in the past, and this really came back to bite me in the ass. So I, I felt this when he said this, because I've made this mistake. One of the worst things you can do is merge two similar functions or classes and add configuration parameters. I've done that so many times where I passed in a bool like is doing this, and then if is doing this is true, okay, tweak the, the code this way. And then if that's false, you know, do a little tweak over here. Yeah, passing in things like that into a function, you know, for the most part ah, are gonna lead to headaches, right? This usually means you're taking two simple, easy to change functions and making them into one hard to change function. And I, I felt that, Nick, I felt that. So definitely uh, check out this thread. And remember, dry is not don't repeat yourself at all costs. It's just a rule of thumb, a guideline. So think for yourself a little bit, how does it apply to your situation? And like Nick says, it's about avoiding repetition of maintenance, not so much repetition of code. Moving on, Apple gave us some more marketing tools. That's better than nothing. Uh, so we'll, you know, let's pick an app, right? Instagram is what they're kind of giving me. So you would type in your app name. I don't have Creator View up on the App Store yet, so I can't do that. So I'll use Instagram as an example, but you can put any app name in here you like. And here you get new app, app update, uh, you know, subscription offer, new offer, uh, whatever you're doing, right? And then you can change the background. It's super simple, right? But it's better than nothing. Uh, and then, you know, you can get, here you get story assets, Twitter, like 16 by nine assets or square for Instagram. Again, if you have a designer or you have some design skills yourself, I highly recommend making like your own custom ones. But if you don't have that, this is better than nothing. And I'm very appreciative that they're providing uh, some tools that pretty much anybody can come in use this and promote your new app, your new updates, new subscription offers, all that stuff. All right, on to AR Corner from Matthew Hallberg here. By the way, disclaimer with AR Corner, I don't call it like AR Kit Corner because not all of this is AR Kit, Apple stuff. This whole section is to just show what's going on uh, with AR, what people are building, because I still think we're a few years away from it, but you can kind of see like these uh, proof of concept things uh, going on. So here you can, you know, basically see through a box. I thought that was pretty cool. Okay, I had to refresh to get that going. But yeah, products, right, with like 3D vision that you can like see through to see the product inside the box. Uh, I thought that was pretty cool. And then here you got like this whole wall of augmented reality. So you're playing a, you know, breaker game or whatever, like kicking a ball up against it. I don't, again, the whole point of this section is to show you like what's coming with AR. Uh, this also, the Carolina Panthers, I live right near the stadium. Uh, so this is pretty cool too. It's kind of mixed reality, right? If you're wearing glasses, you see the Panther mascot that's just like jumping around all the real life stadium. It rips down the Jets flag. This was from their uh, home opener, but uh, yeah, pretty, pretty cool there. I don't know if that's like just done on TV or if you actually wear AR glasses for that one. But anyway, this is actually like mapping someone's body in real time. So as you can see, now it's, of course, right? You can see the blur around it. Sometimes you can see the human body behind it. It like clips, but that's not the point. The point is like, where is this technology going to be in three, five, 10 years? Like it's going to be insane if it's right here already. Like he's just moving around real time. You can see him like, he'll do some like jump kicks in a second to try to like really like mess it up. Uh, and it does mess up a little bit, but again, it's so super early that this is happening in real time. It's like masking him with like a whole thing. Again, AR is going to be crazy, crazy acid trip. Onto the LOLs of the week. Got a kick out of this one from Kyle, me reviewing your pull request. 
1200 nits. <laughs> Pretty, pretty accurate. Uh, and then we got, uh, actually, Alan, this video, uh, photo is what I wanted to share, but I'll set it up with, right? Junior dev makes a mistake. I'm so fired, my career is over. Senior dev makes a mistake. LOL, hey guys, look at, look at this dumb shit I did. True. And then this, this kind of reinforces that, right? Junior devs, your code breaks solid and code style best practices. No, you don't understand and have this argument. And then senior devs are like, your code is shit. Yeah, no. <laughs> and I don't want to like encourage writing like shit code to seem senior. That's not what it is. I think it's just the attitude of the senior dev is like they have enough experience to realize that it's it's kind of amazing like any software works when you really like think about it. They just have a lot more perspective on like this whole software world. It's not that they actually write shit code. Uh, and then finally, this is kind of an LOL and also true, very true, and maybe to help you network, right? How to make technical contacts at Apple. Meet any developer who knows what they're doing. Wait they now work for Apple. <laughs> That's so true. Like I said, I've been doing this six, seven years. When I first started, no contacts at Apple. Now that I've been in the community for that long and meeting people and interacting, whether it's meetups here on Twitter, I have tons of contacts at Apple now. But like he says, they weren't at Apple when I started, <laughs> if that makes sense, right? I met them, they were working wherever else, and then they eventually get hired by Apple. So very true, but also very funny. All right, that's this month's episode of Swift News. Hope you enjoyed the video. We'll see you next month.